Well, as we begin our series of studies this week, uh, we're also coming to the beginning of the final chapter in the letter to the Philippians. And if you recall that the church in Philippi had been founded in the midst of some really tumultuous circumstances. The city itself was considered, although it was in Greece, was considered to be part of the Roman Empire in the fullest sense. Its citizens were given right of citizenship in the Roman Empire. They saw themselves as Romans. Their laws and all their rules were just like Rome. And this was something they were very proud of, so that when Paul comes into the city and begins to preach the gospel, uh, he creates quite a furor in the city because he's disrupting the status quo. And the way he did that was simply creating the equality or preaching the egalitarian nature of Christianity, that Paul wasn't restricting his message to certain higher ends of people, but he was preaching to anybody and everybody who would listen. And that included both free men and slaves. You see, the Roman world was kind of stratified in kind of three uh, social layers. On the top were the citizens. And if you were a citizen, you had all sorts of rights and privileges, which Paul happened to be a Roman citizen. And that's how he got out of jail and, and was able to protect the church for a season because he was a Roman citizen, wrongly accused, wrongly persecuted. But the Roman citizens were on top, and that's what everybody aspired to. You wanted to figure out, how can I become a Roman citizen? Remember the centurion who said to Paul, uh, how did you become a citizen? I paid for my citizenship with a great price. And he could tell that Paul didn't have any money. So basically he said, how in the world would you become a Roman citizen? And Paul said, I was born that way. Which again, amongst the Roman citizens, you could buy citizenship. But if you were born a citizen, that put you in a little kind of higher social strata. And so that was the top of the heap. Then you had in between the, the ordinary people, which there weren't a lot of them. I mean, you had a lot of people who were academics and craftsmen and skilled laborers and so forth, teachers, educators, and, and many of them came out of the Greek world because the Romans viewed the Greek world as being the height of intellectual and philosophical development, as well as they copied their art and used their histories and so forth. And so the Romans held the Greek culture in high regard, uh, and so they treated people people who were of that status uh, better. Uh, they didn't have the rights of the Romans, but nonetheless, they were treated and respected fairly well. But the very bottom was basically not just the poor, but in front, essentially mainly slaves. The city of Rome, we know today, was half the uh, people living in the city were actually slaves. And in a world where they didn't have the technological advancements like we have of uh, you know, built-in plumbing and, and ovens and stoves and microwaves and all the rest of that stuff, which are, we call them labor-saving devices. And uh, they certainly were because in, uh, in 1900, the average woman would spend 60 hours a day just cooking and cleaning for her family. So the fact that we have leisure time, you know, that we can kick back and uh, watch a TV show or to go to church and go out to dinner, these were things that, you know, a significant portion of the Roman population or the Roman world couldn't enjoy. And so if you wanted to have that kind of lifestyle, you would hire or buy a slave. And the more slaves you had, the more life of luxury you could enjoy. And that was really the objective. How do we get to the place where <clears throat> I can live a life of leisure because I've got slaves who are doing all my work for me? And then Paul comes in with this gospel saying that the slave is equal to his master, that uh, God has created all men and all men are created equal in the eyes of God. Uh, if you don't realize it, that's where our founding fathers got that, uh, what did Joe Biden say, you know, you know that thing, that thing, that all men are created equal. <laughs> and uh, the bottom line was that Paul, by doing this, elevated the status of slaves, maybe not outside the church, but when they came into the church, they were viewed the same as the richest and most powerful person in the congregation. And Paul makes it very clear in the beginning of his letter to the Corinthians that there weren't a lot of those people. There weren't a lot of those rich, powerful people in the church or intellectual, astute, or all the rest. They were pretty much mostly common people. There were a few exceptions. Like, for example, we take Lydia, who is the seller of purple, and she opens her house in Philippi and lets the church meet there. But keep in mind that she probably wasn't a Roman citizen. She was just a very wealthy wealthy Greek woman. And so as a consequence, um, she also was kind of put on a lower status, even though she had great wealth. 
And so she may have been one who appreciated the unfairness of the Roman system in that regard, that some people may be not very noble in character, but they're born on the right side of the fence. It's kind of like the royal family in England. One of the things very clear is that a significant percentage of them are pretty dysfunctional people and who don't really deserve the, the high honors that they're given. But the simple bottom line is that, that the whole world was like that in the time of Paul. And then Paul comes in and begins to upset that table. And here's the deal. When there's just a few people who are responding, that's no problem. But when there's a lot of people responding, this creates a lot of opposition. The more the church grew, the more the opposition grew, which ironically was the more bad publicity they got, the more publicity they got, more people were curious to know what they were saying and what they were teaching, and more people who became exposed to the gospel. Now, it took about 200 years, but after about 200 years, half the Roman Empire had converted to Christianity, and the whole culture had begun to go through a major shift. I say all of that because one of the things that Paul was concerned about is that he had put so much time, energy, and effort into building those churches by laying the foundation. He said in 1 Corinthians 3 that there's only one foundation can be laid, and that's Jesus Christ. But he said, be careful, he told the Corinthians, how you build on that foundation. And he said, because I'm afraid that after everything I've done, the sacrifices I've made, that all my labor will be in vain, that basically it'll all fall apart. And how does it fall apart? Well, it can fall apart by, by slippage, that we just stop doing the things that we did in the beginning. We begin to drift away, get distracted, as Jesus said, by other things, and or simple neglect. You know, I just had a conversation with a brother the other day who had begun to experience some slippage in his spiritual life. And as we were talking, one of the things he said, you know, I've just stopped spending time every day reading the word. Well, that's how slippage comes in. And we find that Paul repeatedly says, stand firm in the faith, stand firm in the Lord. He said to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, the Philippians, the, the Thessalonians, he said to the Ephesians. In fact, you know, one of the things that Paul in his great passage about putting on the armor of God in Ephesians 6 repeats three times. He said, uh, put on the armor of God so you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand and therefore stand. He repeats this word stako over and over again in his letters. And it's an interesting word in that it, it, it means what we might think it would mean. That means to stand fast in the Lord, but it means to do it by persevering, by persisting, and more importantly, just simply by holding your ground. In other words, Paul isn't saying that the kingdom of God will grow because we keep on reaching more and more places that haven't been reached. That's kind of the marketing mentality of our culture that if we wanna win America, we've gotta make sure that we're competing with the world and its advertisers and get our message out there alongside everyone else. Yet what we find is that the growth of the early church and pretty much consistently throughout the world through much of church history has not been through the intensive evangelistic efforts of the church as it was as much by the church being the church, the church standing fast in the things that was taught. So one of the things that Paul says, for example, to the Thessalonians, he says, so then brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught. So slippage, or, or it comes in many times when we no longer really hold the things that we were taught. We begin to give consideration to things that are not in alignment with the Word of God. Or in our case today in America, many Christians just simply are going silent. They don't want to offend. They don't want to appear unloving. And I was just sharing with my wife today. I said, I almost feel like in the church we put so much emphasis upon being loving to the non-Christians that we've done it to the neglect of telling them the truth. And the problem is that you're, if you don't tell people the truth, you're not walking in love. You're, you're basically withholding truth so that they'll like you. And it's, it's part of this kind of narcissistic characteristic of, of our age that Christians are more concerned about how the view, world views them than they are what the fate of the world is going to be if they reject Christ. Well, Paul understood one simple thing. He says, if you just stand fast and you hold on and you basically don't allow your faith to be compromised, you don't allow the word of God to be compromised, then you're going to find that you're going to have an impact on the culture. 
It's just going to be that. Your lifestyle is going to stand apart. The culture, though, makes that hard because they want to move you away from them. They want to woo you away, seduce you away. And if they can't do that, they want to pound you so hard that you want to give up your faith and stop being faithful to the Lord. And this is why Paul, he knew that this was going to be the battle that was going to be fought. Not the battle necessarily to convince the world to believe what we believe, but to let them observe how that works out in our life. That our daily walk with God, that we begin to do business differently, we begin to talk differently, our attitude towards people is different. That change effect of Christ is really what becomes the testimony. That's when people begin to say, what is it about you that's different? So I'm not saying that overt evangelism is incorrect, but Paul made it very clear. He says, when they look at your circumspect life, or, or excuse me, Peter says that in 1 Peter 3, he says, when they look at the circumspection of your life, they will respect God and they will want to know the God that you know. Well, again, out of time. We'll pick this up tomorrow because uh, there's still an awful lot to talk about. So blessings and, and go in his grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.